What is the history of tea in Japan? Let's find out more. Hi, tea friends. This is Elsa with Nanoshan, where we share in the pleasure of drinking and discovering genuine farm teas. If you're new to our channel, welcome. We hope that you might expand your brewing skills or learn a little something new about tea. If you're new, please don't forget to hit subscribe. And as always, if you like what you're seeing, we hope you will give us a thumbs up. So let's learn a little bit more about the history of tea in Japan. Tea came to Japan by way of China. Legend goes that in the year 2737 BC, an emperor in China was sitting under a tree with his cup of boiling water when a leaf fell down from the tree above, landed in his cup, and he tasted tea for the first time. So in the centuries that followed, tea became really one of the basic necessities of life in China. In um, the year 760 AD, the book, The Classic of Tea, was written. Right around that time, there were a lot of Japanese monks who were coming to China to study Buddhism. They were encountering tea. They were appreciating the way in which it helped them focus for their meditations. And when they were going back to Japan, not only were they carrying their new findings on Buddhism, but they were also bringing back this appreciation for tea. So specifically in the year 805, we know of two um, monks, Saicho and Kukai, who returned to Japan from China and brought with them tea seeds. Then a couple of years later, in the year 814, there is the first recorded instance of an emperor tasting tea um, for the first time in Japan. So this was Emperor Saga. Now, it's important to keep in mind that in the years that followed, tea in Japan really remained a luxury for emperors, for um, uh, wealthy merchants, and for the Buddhist clergy. Um, tea was being cultivated in the capital, it was being cultivated in imperial grounds, um, and it was really both being appreciated as a nod to China and great admiration for China, and also thanks to the great power of caffeine. Um, this tea really was a sort of drug in the uh, higher echelons of Japanese society. So it's important to keep in mind that at the time, the way in which this tea was being um, transported and then consumed was in a sort of tea cake format, which we now encounter somewhat with our poor teas. So at the time, tea leaves were harvested, they were dried, they were compressed into tea cakes, and then they could then be broken up, pulverized, um, added in with boiling water, and sometimes even salt and spices were also um, incorporated. So then we fast forward to the year 1191, when the Buddhist monk Isai returned to Japan from China. He is considered the founder of Zen Buddhism in Japan, but also in addition with that knowledge, he really brought with him a profound appreciation for the power of tea on well-being, both its ability to really help him focus and concentrate, but also many other different health benefits. So he actually wrote a book which really heavily contributed to the popularity of tea in Japan, um, which celebrated its health benefits. And there's also a story which goes that in the year um, 1214, he gave tea to a hungover shogun who greatly, greatly appreciated T's ability to take him out of his alcohol sickness and which helped spread um, this notion of tea as being extremely 
uh, good for health. So at the time, this tea is transitioning from tea cakes to now tea leaves are dried and they are transported in these pottery uh, pots in a loose leaf format. So we travel onwards in time, then in the 1300s, so tea was really something for the warrior elite in particular. They indulged in all sorts of extravagant and lavish tea gatherings um, with all sorts of tea games, which were a fabulous opportunity for lots of gambling. Um, it was an opportunity for them to show off their extremely um, elaborate, extravagant tea ware that they had brought back from China, extremely ornate bowls and utensils. Um, they played different get blindfolded guessing games where maybe 10 cups of tea would be made and um, participants would have to guess which was the real tea, which was the non-genuine tea. So being a lower grade tea from a less revered tea area. Sometimes in one gathering, participants would drink up to a hundred different cups of tea. So you can imagine that there was definitely some sort of tea high um, going on in these gatherings as well. Um, and at the time, so again, there's this profound appreciation in Japan for all things Chinese. And so it's all about these lavish, extravagant Chinese teaware and utensils. Around the, in the 1500s, around that time, it's also realized that tea trees, which have been shaded by forests in forests outside of Uji, create um, a kind of tea with a very different flavor profile from what's being done in the rest of Japan. So this tea has this little umami note and it quickly becomes the favorite, most revered tea in the land, thanks to that. So if we keep on following these festivities, which are happening in these elite warrior mansions, we experience a kind of shift with these tea celebrations and festivities happening in the homes of very wealthy merchants who are able to show off um, the teaware that they have accumulated on their travels. But actually, they begin to show off their status and their wealth by contrasting this fancy teaware with more and more simplified environments. So it really becomes a, um, a celebration of the simplicity of space, so where people are able to focus on um, the teaware rather than how fancy the environment. In fact, these merchants, these wealthy merchants, are building these simpler and simpler, almost rustic hermitage sites in which to show off their fancy teaware. Um, at the time, tea is so highly revered in Japan that some of these teawares are actually even more um, expensive than pieces of land. So actually, tea status becomes a way to wield power and to impact politics with lords preferring to receive teaware rather than plots of land as a reward. So enter a tea master Sen no Rikyu, who is um, extremely important in Japanese tea history both for having perfected the tea ceremony and also for having really encouraged a shift from this lavish, extravagant tea ceremony, Chinese, heavily Chinese-influenced tea style, towards something that became more and more Chinese, I'm sorry, Japanese, and actually a celebration of the wabi-sabi aesthetic. So Senorikyu, before I dive into that, was such a celebrated, highly celebrated tea master that he was actually the tea master to two of Japan's most important feudal lords during his lifetime. 
Um, he so encouraged a transition towards simpler Japanese made teaware where imperfection was actually celebrated and it was much more about simplicity and he created this awareness of the wabi-sabi aesthetic which is a Japanese embrace of intransience, of imperfection, of nature, of a passing of time, of the fact that nothing can be repeated, and of the sort of loneliness that comes with that impermanence. Um, and Senorikyu, in his work as a tea master, really led this transition towards a simpler tea ritual, towards a much more um, a tea ceremony that was much more about connecting with the self, with the guests, with the now, and not about having fancy golden gilded um, tea wares. So as he was working as the tea master for feudal lord Hideyoshi, he helped to organize for his lord what remains to this day the largest tea gathering in Japanese tea history, which is called the Grand Kitano Tea Gathering in 1587. And this was um, a celebration where anyone who was anyone in the world of tea, anyone who knew anything, was invited. And it was also, sneakily enough, a way for um, the Lord to keep an eye on who was doing what in the tea world and how were their tea rituals evolving. So Senorikyu had an, an incredibly close relationship with this feudal lord, but that began to deteriorate after this gathering. And there's different thoughts as to why. It could be that it had to do with the fact that they had different aesthetics, um, but regardless of why, at some point in the year 1590, Lord Hideyoshi orders Senorikyu to commit suicide. And this is the end of this great tea master. However, his impact um, continues even to this day because his um, children and grandchildren went on to found three of the most important tea schools, which to this day, if you are a student of the Japanese tea ceremony of the Chanoyu, it is very likely that you are in one of the schools founded by the descendants of Sen no Rikyu. So from 1641 to 1853, Japan undergoes this period of isolation. Um, it's no longer importing tea from China. It's purely relying on its own internal cultivation. And at this time, it also, Japan really perfects matcha um, and the Japanese tea ceremony. So meanwhile in China, um, tea traditions are evolving towards loose leaf tea, but Japan is really obsessing with this ritualized almost dance of the tea ceremony and creates matcha, which uh, really becomes all its own, even though powdered tea had originally come from China. It's now really this Japanese um, perfected beverage. Then we have in 1738, um, the the so tea is actually steamed for the first time and in this steaming process a tea is born which is incredibly bright, incredibly fresh, incredibly flavorful um, and up until this point really high quality high tasting tea had been entirely reserved for the elite and after this new steaming step um, which is done by Nagatai, I'm sorry, by Nagatani Soen. Um, high, 
high quality tea becomes a thing for the general population. So this is a very important development, really the creation of Sensha as we know it today. Um, and then about a hundred years later, in 1836, the shading of the tea bushes is perfected. And this is the next step necessary to create what we consider today as our high-grade Japanese tea, so our gyokuros um, and kabuseches. So that is an overview of the important steps that led to our Japanese teas today. Thank you so much for watching. Please don't forget to give us a thumbs up. We hope you'll join us for more tea next time. Bye.